I'd like to call this markup to order. Today, uh, we have the opening statements for the markup of the U.S. Agricultural Sector Relief Act of 2012 and the Asthma Inhaler Relief Act of 2012. And, the, and we have a third? Oh, and the No More Solyndras Act. I had actually forgotten about the No More Solyndras Act. So we have three pieces of the legislation that we're going to be marking up, and we're going to have the opening statements today. So at this time, I would recognize myself for the purpose of an opening statement, five minutes. This morning, earlier today, we had a hearing on the first two pieces of legislation. And on the U.S. Agricultural Sector Relief Act of 2012, we heard from four representatives of agricultural groups, uh, one from Michigan, one from Florida, and two from California, as, as well as a witness for the Natural Resources Defense Council, Mr. Doniger. And the testimony was about the access to methyl bromide, which has been banned uh, in the U.S. because of the agreement that the United States has as a signatory to the Montreal Protocol. The witnesses this morning uh, testified that they really did not have any adequate substitute for methyl bromide. And while all of them had important testimony, the one piece of testimony that really stood out for me was uh, when the representative of the Strawberry Association pointed out that the, the California Department of Food and Agriculture commissioned a report which concluded that the lack of methyl bromide or a viable alternative could mean that California communities will lose over $1.5 billion annually and more than 23,000 jobs. Uh, this legislation allows for the continued use of uh, what we call the critical use application to the Montreal Protocol to allow the continued use of methyl bromide in certain situations. The second bill, the Asthma Inhalers Relief Act, we have a company that still has about a million units of uh, primatine mist in storage they have been unable to sell primatine mist and it has been the only non-prescription drug uh, or medicine on the market uh, to deal with uh, asthma and the company if they are allowed the opportunity to distribute these uh, this medicine again uh, they will not receive any profit from the sale of it but will donate it to charity and so the issue becomes, we've had heard some testimony today from physicians who say that it really is not safe. Uh, from my perspective, it's a medicine that has been on the, in the marketplace for about 40 years. It is the only medicine available today to deal with asthma without a prescription. And so uh, this uh, bill would allow those one million units to be distributed uh, and in hopes at the end of that time there would be another uh, non-prescription drug that would be approved by the FDA uh, to help people uh, deal with uh, asthma. And then uh, the third bill is the No More Solyndras Act. I think all of us are quite familiar with the purpose of this uh, legislation and that is to prevent any further cylinders from taking place on uh, loan guarantees or grants from the Department of Energy and require the Treasury Department to have more input before uh, those kinds of loan guarantees are uh, uh, awarded again. So uh, I'll yield back the balance of my time and I, and at this point, I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Rush, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, as you know, it has been just over two hours ago 
when we held a hearing on two of the three bills that we are uh, are marking up today, the Agricultural Sector Relief Act and the Asthma Inhalers Relief Act. Members on both sides of the aisle urged the subcommittee to hold another hearing so that we can hear from and ask, ask questions of administrators, administration witnesses. During our discussion on the Agricultural Relief Act, we heard contradictory statements from panelists over whether or not there was indeed uh, an alternative to methyl bromide in the cultivation of growing crops. While some witnesses were adamant that there were no other viable substitutes for methyl bromide, I entered into the record letters from farmers who insisted that they had found alternatives which were healthier and less damaging to the environment. Unfortunately, Mr. Chairman, due to the haste in which we are having this markup, the members of the subcommittee would not have the opportunity to hear directly from and to have their questions answered by the very experts in the agencies of jurisdiction, including the EPA and the USDA, who are responsible for overseeing these programs before this, the members of this committee decide on how we will vote on the pending legislation. Mr. Chairman, additionally, it literally feels like just minutes ago, uh, we were here in this very same room listening to witnesses give competing testimony over whether or not primatine mist, the drug at the center of the Asthma Reduction Act, is unhealthy for over-the-counter use. While one doctor asserted that she had concerns stemming from side effects related to cardiac issues, among others, another doctor on the panel told us that he was pretty fine, he was okay with using the drug for emergency asthma attacks. Uh, Mr. Chairman, on an issue so important to the health and well-being of our constituents, it would seem to me uh, that members of the subcommittee would indeed benefit greatly <coughs> by hearing testimony from expert agency witnesses from the FDA and the EPA on these important matters. So I ask you again, Mr. Chairman, what's the rush? Why is there a fire being shouted in the theater on these particular matters? Why is it more important to get these bills through the subcommittee quickly rather than getting all the facts and doing all of our due diligence to make sure that we get these bills done correctly? Mr. Chairman, I've often extended the hand of assistance and friendship and uh, to you and to the ranking member of the full committee uh, and Mr. Waxman's assistance also in assuring that EPA, USDA, FDA, and any other relevant agency representatives will respond in a timely manner to a request to appear before this subcommittee to discuss these bills. If the idea is to truly address these issues, and to provide re legislative relief for the parties that would be affected by these bills, then I will submit that there is rel relatively small chance that any of these bills that we're debating and discussing and marking up today will get through the Senate or that either of these bills will be signed into law by the president. So why don't we, why do don't we do the necessary legwork uh, and the preliminary legwork to make sure that we are at least hearing from all the experts who are indeed responsible
for implementing and overseeing these various programs before hastily marking up these bills. And Mr. Chairman, in conclusion, I would just let like for the record to show that I am against this speedy expediting process of bringing these bills to markup without hearing from some of the most relevant managers uh, of these programs, and uh, that is uh, those individuals at the EPA and the FDA. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much, Mr. Rush. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Barton, for a five-minute opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, let me say on the record that I think you are to be commended and Mr. Upton are be, to be commended for, one, having legislative hearings on these bills, and two, scheduling a subcommittee markup on these bills. Um, I, uh, I'm not quite where Mr. Rush is that this is speedy, but I think it's a good thing the committee is using regular order and actually going through a process that all members have a chance to have input to and, and, um, and be participative in the hearing and then hopefully in the open markup uh, that begins tomorrow. So I think that's a good thing, not a bad thing. We've got three bills that are going to be before the subcommittee tomorrow. The Agriculture Relief Act, I'm supportive without any changes. I think that's a good piece of legislation. I know that it could be changed, and perhaps tomorrow there will be amendments to it, but as is, I would vote for it. On the Asthma and Haler Relief Act of 2012, uh, as I said that at the legislative hearing, no good deed goes unpunished, and the chief sponsor, Dr. Burgess, is simply trying to make available to average Americans an over-the-counter uh, drug that has been in use for 50 years and is, is in the warehouse but can't be sold uh, because of a, uh, uh, an act of Congress and then subsequent to that a decision by the executive branch to take those products off the market. There are two issues in play. One is a uh, political correctness issue dealing with hydrofluorocarbons uh, uh, and the other is a uh, uh, an issue of, if I say this right, efficacious? How close am I? Efficacy, Efficacy issue. Close enough. <laughs> and, and, and apparently there is a real debate whether the active medicinal drug in the uh, primatine mist uh, is efficacious or not. But since it's been on the market, I come down, we should allow it to be. But more importantly, we should allow those that have already been manufactured to be sold before they expired. But the more important issue, issue there, as Dr. Burgess pointed out in the hearing this morning, is that um, there's really no excuse for, for EPA and FDA not having an over-the-counter over remedy available for customers and consumers today. You wouldn't need to sell the, the primatine inhaler if they had made available an over-the-counter alternative, which they have not done. On the last bill, uh, the No More Solyndras Act, uh, I am very supportive of the underlying intent of the bill. Uh, um, I do think that we need to uh, uh, reform the, um, the loan program that's in existence today. Uh, I think the, those parts of the bill that deal with uh, making it absolutely clear that subordination is not allowed and it's my understanding Dr. Burgess is going to have a, an amendment on uh, some penalties if they do subordinate, uh, which I'll be supportive of. Where I'm a little bit different than the bill is currently drafted is I don't see a reason to totally repeal the existing loan program for alternative energy projects, the 1703-1705. So I am working with the chairman. Uh, and other interested members on an amendment that would um, stop any new loans from going forward subject to a report by the uh, Secretary of the, of the Energy Department back to this committee and to the, the Senate Energy Committee that either the program should go forward with reforms or the program should be terminated. And if the Secretary does not issue such a report by a time certain in the next Congress, then the program would be terminated. Again, that's a work in progress, Mr. Chairman, 
and there are members looking at it and and but we hope by markup tomorrow to have an amendment that both sides have agreed upon uh, in that area but bottom line the fact that this subcommittee is is acting to prevent any more solyndras is a good thing not a bad thing and I am very supportive of us legislating in this area and with that I uh, again thank the subcommittee chairman for his leadership and I yield back my time. Thank you very much and at this time I recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we are considering three bills that have not been thought through. Each would have unintended consequences and none of the bills offer real solutions to the problems they pur purport to address. The first bill is a No More Cylinders Act. This is not serious legislation. It's a political bill that's designed to keep Solyndra in the news. It's our job to recognize uh, that families across America are suffering from record droughts, wildfires, storms, and floods that have been linked to climate change. And it's our responsibility to develop responsible policies to reduce the carbon emissions that are causing these woes. But we're failing miserably at these responsibilities. Under the Solyndra legislation, Tens of billions of dollars of loan guarantees will be issued in the years to come. They don't stop the program, but they freeze the projects that could apply for these funds to those that are already uh, are on the list. Uh, new breakthrough technologies would not even be eligible. Creating a legislative winner's list of projects eligible for loan guarantees is not the way to reform this program. The other two bills would undermine the effectiveness of the Montreal Protocol. One bill would increase the use of methyl bromide, a pesticide that's a powerful ozone-depleting chemical. Uh, methyl bromide has been banned since 2005, but there is a mechanism in the law for critical use exemptions, and each year growers apply for exemptions. EPA analyzes those applications with the help of USDA, and the U.S. government requests critical use exemptions under the Montreal Protocol. This process is, is in place. And since 2005, the level of criti critical use exemptions re requested by the U.S. and granted through the Montreal Protocol has decreased dramatically. Uh, that's what's supposed to happen. The bill reverses all the progress that's been made. It, instead of requiring growers to justify continued use of methyl bromide, the bill reverses the presumption and places the burden of proof on EPA. The bill also freezes into law an outdated list of approved critical uses. Sectors that have completely phased out the use of methyl bromide during the last seven years, like golf courses, would be permitted to use methyl bromide again, and the bill creates a gaping emergency event loophole. I have cons since concerns about the primatine mist bill. Primatine mist is an over-the-counter epinephrine inhaler from the 1960s. It was phased out at the end of 2011 and has been off the shelves for over six months. The bill would take the extraordinary action of putting primatine mist back on the shelves so its manufacturer could sell off its remaining inventory, which should take place, they tell us, in nine months. Taking that kind of action might make sense if the inhaler was necessary for public health. But we've heard testimony earlier today that medical and public health organizations oppose the use of primatine mist because it's not safe or recommended for treating asthma. That's what the American Thoracic Society and the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America have told us. We had a doctor on the panel who testified, I'm sure at the request of the manufacturer, who also had a chance to testify. Uh, with a different point of view, but companies that already made their necessary investments to develop CFC-free inhalers say that there's no justification for this bill because it provides a special treatment to a single company. Now, I know people say, but this is the only uh, over-the-counter inhaler. Well, we only get an over-the-counter over inhaler if there's a company wants to sell an over-the-counter inhaler. FDA can't provide it for us. And it's not convincing to me 
that we ought to allow an over-the-counter inhaler if it's not doing what it should be doing, if there are better treatments, and if the people involved in dealing with asthma medically say they don't think they ought to have this drug out there because it has some serious consequences for heart attacks particularly. So I, I, um, I, I'm not ready to support that bill. I don't see the argument for it. And um, uh, I, at this point, I'm going to oppose it. But I do think Mr. Rush makes a good point. Let's get more information. What's the, what's the, what's the, why we have to be so speedy? Or why do we have to be, so, why do we have to rush? I said Mr. Rush. And I agree with Mr. Rush. There's no rush that should force us to move forward without fully understanding the consequences of what we're doing. So I, uh, I thank the cha chairman for this uh, opportunity to make an opening statement. And uh, we'll look forward to the markup. Thank you, uh, Mr. Waxman. And uh, at this time, I'll recognize for three minutes the gentleman from Texas and the sponsor of the private team, Ms. Bill, Dr. Burgess. I thank the chairman for the recognition. Um, the, 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 the whole issue of the over the counter epinephrine multi dose inhaler is not that it was with, gradually withdrawn from the market. It was abruptly withdrawn. It was withdrawn on December 31st of this year. And it wasn't withdrawn because of any medical considerations, despite the fact that we heard testimony to that fact today. It was withdrawn because it contained as a propellant for the epinephrine to get it into the lungs, to deliver it into the lungs of the asthmatic patient who is in crisis, a compound called chlorofluorocarbon which I understand was supposed to be removed under the Montreal Protocol. Look, I got no problem if they took the chlorofluorocarbons out of my underarm deodorant or my hair, hairspray. But we're talking about a medication that was efficacious for asthmatics. It was inexpensive. And we had some discussion on the panel this morning, but I will just tell you, as someone who buys these medicines on a somewhat regular basis, the HFA-containing albuterol inhaler cost about $55. For two of the primatine inhalers, which incidentally last longer than an HFA inhaler, for two of those inhalers, it's $32. In other words, a $32 investment can pretty much take care of whatever needs an occasional asthmatic such as myself might encounter for almost a year's time. That's a pretty good bargain. And we heard uh, we hear from people all the time that we need to be cost effective in our medical treatments. This sounds pretty cost effective. Now, there was an elaborate game of hide the ball this morning, and it's been going on for months. It's been going on for over a year, actually, and it, quite frankly, it just needs to stop. If the Environmental Protection Agency has a problem with the medical indication of using inhaled epinephrine, then they need to say so. If the Food and Drug Administration has a problem with the use of inhaled epinephrine for the treatment of asthmatics, then it needs to say so. But this nonsensical finger pointing of one federal agency at the other, refusing to answer any questions when submitted over and over again in writing, asking direct questions when they're here at the witness table in both our health subcommittee, in the energy subcommittee, in the oversight and investigation subcommittee where they're sworn to testify under oath, it makes no sense that there has been this elaborate deception on the part of the federal agencies. I mean, come clean with us. Tell us, tell us why it is you feel this way. It's necessary for this legislation to go forward. There has been plenty of time for the uh, affected agencies to, to actually divulge their information to us, but they choose not to. I think the legislation is going to go a long way towards helping asthmatic patients in this country. It's high time it happened. It probably should have happened last December before the ban went into place. But nevertheless, we can correct that defect now. Uh, I urge people to look at this seriously and support the legislation when we mark it up tomorrow. And I'll yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Dr. Burgess. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, for a three-minute opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the time. I've been involved in the cylinder oversight process since our first hearing. From early in this process, I was disappointed in some of the decisions by the administration. As we conducted our oversight, it became obvious to me that the fervor to save the deal overshadowed the opinions of many that cylinder was a sinking ship. The fervor led to bad decisions, most notably to subordinate the federal government's stake in the investment to that of private outside investors. 
Contrary to the testimony of at least one witness last week, there has been no evidence brought in front of our committee that political favoritism played any role in the Salinda process. Instead, there have been many documents indicating that rushed decisions, sloppiness, and wishful thinking determine the outcome. No administration, Democrat or Republican, is immune from making mistakes. And in a side note, I remember about six or seven years ago under President Bush administration, the IRS spent hundreds of millions of dollars for a computer system that we couldn't use. So I think we have a problem with uh, buying things in our, in our government. The assistance by the majority to continue ins insinuating criminal activity, cronyism, and to continue scoring partisan points is reckless. We are sitting here today with the actual opportunity to fix the problem with the loan guarantee program, but the majority insists on bringing up a bill filled with unnecessary rhetoric and gutting a program they once championed. The next step on Solyndra is a simple one. Completely close the door on subordination and direct Department of Energy to implement procedures that would prevent the mistakes that occurred from happening again. We don't need pages of findings. We, we do not need a, to sunset a problem that, that has enormous potential. The bill before us today will prevent any of the remaining loan guarantees from going toward new innovative technologies. Under the Republican plan, the biggest qualifying factor will, will become when the application was postmarked, not the content of the application. Energy industries will lose a potential transformative funding because of an overreaction to Solyndra. If the Republicans want to eliminate the program, eliminate it. I don't support that approach, but at least we're not hamstring the program and force us to spend money inefficiently. It, would not just, it will not just be renewable energy technology that suffers. Potential innovations in oil and gas and nuclear are also at stake as well. This program is a good idea that I supported when the Republicans developed it in 2005 energy law, and it's still a good idea today. We need to perform it, not disable it. I need to yield back. This time I recognize the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Scalise, for a three-minute opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate you bringing these bills forward to protect taxpayer money and, and to protect jobs, as, as we're seeing, are under assault by the Obama administration on so many different fronts. Uh, you know, as it relates to the bill to prevent more cylindras, uh, we just had a hearing recently in this committee uh, where the new head of the loan program came forward and basically acknowledged that he's willing to continue to put taxpayers in the back of the line uh, if he does a subordination of a loan in spite of the fact that the law doesn't give him that authority. Uh, and even the Treasury Department, uh, back during Solyndra, raised red flags and said you ought to talk to Justice Department before doing it because it's probably something you can't do. And yet he's going to continue to double down on that failed policy that not only got a Solyndra, uh, but as we've seen, that we got Beacon Power went, went bankrupt. Uh, you've also got, just today we heard, uh, a new solar company, uh, Amonix, just announced that they're shutting down their Nevada plant after getting $15 million from the Obama administration. And yet they want to continue going forward with this, and they'll criticize us when we're saying enough is enough. Let's start protecting the taxpayers uh, and stopping these cylinders from going forward. But clearly we know the Obama administration wants to keep doing them. They want to even keep putting the taxpayers in the back of the line when such a dismal failure like Solyndra showed half a billion dollars of taxpayer money could be lost. Uh, you know, we saw what happened with uh, earlier today, we had a hearing uh, in relation to this, uh, this pesticide that EPA is trying to block. Uh, look, I represent strawberry farmers, farmers in, in Ponchatoula, Louisiana, uh, that would be at risk. We had California farmers, we had Michigan farmers come here and testify that we could lose thousands of American jobs. Uh, and oh, by the way, they're developing nations that still allow these pesticides to be used. They're going to get our jobs. Uh, so now more jobs would be exported by the exporter in chief who's running this country and continuing to run jobs out of the country with these crazy policies uh, that have nothing to do with safety. Uh, you know, as Mr. Burgess has pointed out, uh, you know, you've got a great product for, for asthma that's, that's at risk right here with these policies. I mean, it's just one after the other of continued radical regulations being brought forward by this administration. And, and we've already seen the results. It's not like we're, we're trying to take a preemptive strike. We've seen billions of dollars of taxpayer money lost. We've seen millions of jobs leave our country. And we're saying enough is enough, and yet there's still people that are trying to block this. They want to keep going forward. Uh, you know, and then the president comes out uh, just recently with his latest tax increase proposal. Uh, and this is after, in 2009, the president said, you don't raise taxes because that would just suck up, take more demand out of the economy and put businesses in a further hole. That was in 2009. Well, now he wants to raise those same taxes that he said would kill jobs. 
And in fact, we just got a report that came out uh, through the National Federation of Independent Businesses that shows that 700,000 jobs would be lost if the president got his tax increase. Uh, you just see one after the other. It's, it's Solyndra versus Keystone. We want Keystone to create jobs. The president wants more Solyndras to run more money and more jobs out of this country. We can't afford to do it. It's time we stop and pass these bills. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. And uh, I would remind everyone that members' opening statements will be made part of the record pursuant to committee rules. And I do have Mr. Upton's opening statement that also will be part of the record. And I see no other members uh, here to make an opening statement. So at this point, the chair would call up the Asthma Inhalers Relief Act of 2012 and ask the clerk to report. Discussion draft to direct the administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency to allow for the distribution, sale, and consumption in the United States of remaining inventories of over-the-counter CFC epinephrine inhalers. Without objection, the first reading of the bill will dispense with and the bill will be open for amendments at any point, uh, so ordered. And for the information of members, we're, we will now be on the Asthma Inhalers Relief Act of 2012, the markup. The subcommittee will reconvene tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. And I would remind members that the chair will give priority recognition to amendments offered on a bipartisan basis. And uh, I look forward to seeing all of you tomorrow, and particularly you, Mr. Rush. I look forward to seeing be with you all day tomorrow. And without objection, the subcommittee would now. Uh, did you have a comment, Mr. Well, Mr. Mr. Chairman? Since we have been here all day uh, well, on matters of importance to you and to industry, uh, might I uh, suggest that you take the full committee out for dinner tonight? And then you provide a breakfast for us tomorrow, <laughs> and that would at least show us that you are uh, grateful to uh, us for spending all of today and all of tomorrow in your in in the power of your presence. Well, I appreciate that very much that you brought that to my attention, and uh, I don't know if I'll take all every member because there are not many here, but. I can round them up, Mr. Chairman, okay. if, it, if it's on you. Thank you, sir. And without objection, <laughs> I want to get out of here. The subcommittee will stand in recess. <laughs>